name is Nazim Odin. Um, I'm 26 years old. I live in Swinton in Salford. I'll be doing four great runs, two being 10Ks and the last two being half marathons. The charity um, I'm working alongside with is called Muslim Hands. Muslim mm -hmm. Hands um, deal with a variety of um, projects. I recently right now for, in Syria for Syrian refugees in Palestine. Um, you know, Muslim Hands first started out as a community from Nottingham where the community came together um, to help the during the Bosnian crisis. The funds raised will be given to a clinic in Gaza where the um, procedure is taking place to basically help them retain their childhood, help them come to terms with the trauma and the tragedies that they've experienced in their short lives. I mean, you can imagine there's a lot of children that have lost their homes, their family members. I understand that it's easy for us, for us because we're not there it's easy for us to say it's not our problem, it's the government the true problem, it's, it's our fault. It is really our fault. We could have stopped it, but we didn't. People became desensitized. They thought, no, it's okay, it'll get better. Things like this don't get better unless we do something about it. Hence why I'm doing this, because the way I see it, to really save those Palestinian children, to really save their land, is to give them a future, a chance with, where they can grow up to be decent human beings. Because I know from first time, when a psychological issue from a young age goes unchecked, it carries to adulthood and it, and it manifests into something horrible. It changes you. I mean, this, their trauma and my trauma, they're not um, the same. However, the trauma itself is real enough and it's something that connects me to them. I knew this woman, she was seven years ago, this was, uh, she was a kind, gentle and caring soul. Uh, I remember when we first met, it was under a shelter of rain as she's as that sounds. Um, she asked who I was and I replied with a smile, only the most interesting man in your life. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a bit of a cheesy thing to say but uh, made her laugh and um, when I talk about her, I try to talk about her, I stumble really. I find it difficult. It brings back a lot of good memories but a lot of bitter memories after her passing. She would always encourage me. She always believed in me. <laughs> she would always tell me that I was meant for great things. I would laugh at that and still do and she would just power he said even if you don't believe me I do we were planning on getting married I already made the essential plans to tell the parents do this and that somehow marriage somehow makes you responsible all of a sudden <laughs> but we never got to that point I never got to the chance she unfortunately died soon after and I could stay here and and just tell you all how I accept her death. I believe it was a sign her death had come. No, I um, I um, did the opposite of that. I um, I lost control. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to handle the grief. Eventually, um, that grief turned into a fever. That fever turned into anger, and that anger led to suffering that turned me different. That is when my depression truly cemented its place into my psyche. I mean, I've had depressions for years. I was a miserable kid, but that one loss, that one bad day, that's, um, that's when everything went spiraling out of control. Numerous times as a child, I was told that there is a God. I would ask, where is he then? How do you know there's a God? I felt like they were just trying to enforce their views on me. I was a child, I was going through my own problems and I had people telling me about this God out there who just magically makes everything disappear. That's how they pictured it to me. I would say I only hate Islam because of what I was going through personally and that emotionally connected to it. 
Um, so it didn't really. So I rebelled against the religion for the past fifteen years. Didn't really follow it. People have tried um, viciously trying to get me back on it. They failed each time. Recent years, I realised that it wasn't Islam I hated. I mean, it was the people, some of the people who followed it, that I had a problem with. Before I went to Santorini, before I went to Greece, um, I prayed the night before. Uh, the first time ever really properly praying, asking God, as a word, that is, is me going to Santorini a good idea, good idea on my own as well. And that night, I um, got a dream. Didn't really think anything of it, but this dream was me not going to Santorini, but I was at home being miserable. Woke up that one that one morning and thought, forget that I'm going to Santorini. I went, and it was the best decision in my life. So I went to Santorini and I trekked a mountain called Montero. There I met a man named Abel Ataman. When I first met Abel, I was, you know, looking ahead at a cliffside. And behind me was an old elderly man saying, if you're gonna jump, then don't hesitate. <laughs> Turned around, there he was. We spoke for great hours. We were like kindred souls, really. He would say, we were wayward sons walking a lonesome road. Through him, I remember the promise that I made, the promise I made to, to the woman um, the last seven years ago. But I couldn't believe I, I forgot that promise. The promise was that Nazim, no matter what happens, you have to promise me that you'll strive to be a better man. And I made that promise, didn't think anything of it, but after she passed, I did keep that promise. That is what hurt me the most because I, I dishonored her, I insulted her memory by breaking my promise to her. Before I left Santorini, Abel said that this is most likely we are never gonna see each other again. Now Tom, don't say that, we'll see each other again, old man. <laughs> he said, he said, inshallah, means if, if Allah wills it. He said, but Nazim, promise me that you will take in with everything I said and strive to be better. I said, I promise. And I didn't do that. After I came back from Santorini, I, I immediately started doing charity all of a sudden. I did the cycle tour from London to Paris, um, on the Eiffel Tower. Um, recently I did the, um, I ran five marathons. The last being in Birmingham where I dressed up as a flash, that was awesome. <laughs> but at the same time, it wasn't really making an effect, if that makes sense. I was doing well, for doing good to others, but I wasn't really doing any good to myself. I wasn't really making any sort of difference, really. The anger was still there, the hate, the suffering, it was still there. And it was growing. Then I realized that this is, this is probably not what Abel meant, you know? It's good that I do the runs, but this is, this is probably not what he meant at all. What she meant. You know, after my fourth runs, I decided to go back. So I've done, since then I did the Coventry Half Marathon. And after that, I took on my my eighth run, the the full, the Manchester 26 miles marathon. And I dressed up as the Flash again on that day. On that day, and not just that, but I also um, wore a, a bag filled with weights. The reason why I did that was to personify mental health in physical form. That run was when I officially started fighting for mental health a lot more harder. Now, of course it was a bit stupid, you know? I was wearing a freaking flash outfit in a hot boiling day, wearing weight on a 26 miles run. Yeah, it was stupid, but you know what? It was for the cause. I had to go hard. Depression, you can't see depression, can you? No one can see it. So I decided to personify myself and, and to show that no matter how hard things get, you can move forward. Even if you're last, really last, but you can move forward. I'm passionate about mental health, really. I know how hard it is. I know how tough it is. I know how sometimes we look in the mirror 
and we hate ourselves so much. I try to help as many people as I can with their struggles, depression, their anxiety, any sort of health. I do my best, mentor them as best I can. And yes, I've, I've lost a few along the way, but I've also helped a lot along the way as well. I help them because I know what it feels like when everyone else looks the other way. So I decided to, to make something, to create something, an ideal. It's, it's like a joke or something, but I called it Reignite, a phoenix as it were. Reignite isn't a charity, just some charity, isn't just some company, no, it's an ideal. An ideal to truly bring people together. A shield that defends, not a dagger in the back. That's what Reignite is. Hope. And that's what I want to do. Is spread hope. And honour the promise I made. To the one I lost. To Abo. To all those I've lost to depression, anxiety. Because I lost a hell of a lot of people over the years. Because through my own pity and self-loathing there were others I had friends who were going through a lot of struggles they cried out for help they cried out and and I was so busy feeling sorry for myself that I ignored them and because of my inaction and because of my ignorance they died Since February, I decided to raise funds to build two wells. One for my parents and the other for the friends I lost to, who lost their bow to depression. Now, I did a lot of, um, a couple of runs since then. But the reason why I wanted to build a well, especially for the friends I lost to depression, is because it's, to, it's like um, a final tribute to them. You know, personally, I feel like I failed them. They did call out for my help. Even though it's not my fault what happened, because I too was, well, not in the right frame of mind during, during those years. But still, they were my friends. And there's a part of me that feels I've let them down. That's why I'm doing all this. That's what pushes me. Because I owe it to them, I owe it to her, I owe it to my friends I've lost to bloody depression, I owe it to my mentor, Abel. They won't let me give in, they feel me, they haunt my very memories for a reason. To say, get up and keep moving. There's always hope. People can change because there's always hope.